You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 278. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hey, veggie lovers, welcome to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Oh my gosh, this episode is so fun. My cheeks hurt from how much smiling and laughing I did during this episode. If y'all don't already know Hannah Sundarani of Two Spoons, she's got the blog Two Spoons and uh, social media and a YouTube channel. She is the most adorable, fun person. I had so much fun. So Hannah is the creator of the popular blog Two Spoons and the Two Spoons app. She is an editor at The Feed Feed, a contributor to Best of Vegan, and a recipe contributor to Thrive and One Green Planet. Her recipes have also been featured in numerous magazines, including Better Homes and Gardens, Simply Gluten Free, Veg News, House and Home, Elle Canada, and Cosmopolitan. So she is originally from Canada, but she got to live in France for four years, which is what inspired her to write this book, The Two Spoons Cookbook, More Than 100 French-Inspired Vegan Recipes. So in this podcast, we're talking about her plant-based journey, which unfortunately began with a tragedy in her life, but you know, took some interesting turns there. We talk about how she became such a great cook and her life as a foodie since she was little. We talk about French cuisine and how it's not known as being the most vegan friendly, a funny story that she had while she was in France with being vegan. We also talk about how living in France changed her perspective on food and eating. And I think we uh, shared some great insights there on some things that maybe here in the westernized culture, um, we can start to adopt some of the French ways as well. Then we talk about parenting on a plant-based diet. We talk about being a mom and a career woman and how she's been able to balance that. And we really share some insights and some wisdom that she has developed on asking for help. So I think this episode, it's just, it's really fun to listen to. I hope you love it, but this is especially going to be helpful for all the new parents out there that just need a little reassurance and uh, need to hear some tips on how to make the journey a little bit easier on themselves. But if you like French food, if I If you just love delicious vegan food, you have to get this cookbook. I'm going to definitely be making a couple of these recipes this weekend. So I'm very excited. Thank you so much for being here to my longtime listeners week after week. I love you so much to my new listeners. Welcome. So glad to have you here. Stick around for a while, explore, and please share episodes with other people that you think may benefit from this. So welcome. Hannah Sundarani. Hannah Sundarani, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I could tell we're going to have a fun time because we've already been laughing before (laughs) I even hit record. That's always a good sign. So let's start from the beginning. Tell us about your plant-based journey. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I feel like we have to really backtrack um, because my plant-based journey wasn't necessarily linear and it was a bit of a long journey for me. So I kind of started my plant-based journey when I was in my early 20s. I was in university. Um, I actually had something pretty tragic happen. I lost my boyfriend at the time to cancer. Um, He was, you know, battling it for a couple years and unfortunately, um, inevitably, he lost the battle. Um, And so I was really 
going through this major grieving process. Um, and I feel like grief always kind of manifests itself in a different way. And for me, it really took a toll on my body. So I kind of went from this like university student who was eating a lot of like, um, like chicken fingers and French fries and like, um, macaroni and cheese and kind of like these, you know, more highly processed foods to, um, finding that I was really struggling with the foods that I was eating. It was taking a huge toll on my body. I ended up developing severe IBS. Um, and when I say uh, irritable bowel syndrome for people who don't know, and when I say like severe, it, like I couldn't even sit through like a one hour lecture, like that gave me a lot of anxiety. Um, and so I ended up turning to food for medicine. Um, I went to see a few GI specialists prior to that. And they kind of just said like, this is the life you're going to lead now. Like you just have IBS and like, this is how it is. There's no cure. Um, which felt like really, I felt really defeated by. So I ended up turning to food for medicine and I ended up doing an elimination diet. And in that elimination diet, I gave up dairy. Um, I also gave up gluten, refined sugars and caffeine. Um, and that was kind of the first introduction into a plant-based diet, especially the dairy aspect, um, kind of switching my milks over to things like almond milk. And then even things like gluten, it kind of opened the world to like, like that more healthy form of eating, adding things like quinoa, um, gluten-free versions of, you know, like grains that, you know, we're more used to uh, in our everyday, kind of like finding different flours and stuff like that. So I feel like that was kind of like a very early introduction for me in my early 20s. Um, and it really kind of opened up this world of eating that I never really knew existed. And when I started eating like that, it was like, honestly, like within a week, it was almost like a 180 degree shift. Like it wasn't perfect from the get go. Um, it did take, you know, a few years for me to get completely back to normal, but the, the difference that it made within those first few weeks, I was like, wow, like I can, like I can sit through an hour lecture now. Like this is amazing. So I feel like that was kind of my introduction. And then slowly it kind of opened the world into like vegan eating and, you know, what that kind of meant to me. And I, I transferred kind of more away from meats. Um, and I ended up becoming vegan uh, when we moved to France. And we can talk a little bit about that after about my, my trip to France. Yeah, that's super interesting. Okay. Wow. That is... <laughs> Sounds like a very impactful time in your life, though. Like, what a tragedy ha having to go through that. And it's so heavy at such a young age. Did you feel like isolated during this? I mean, it's got to be hard to be that age and to lose somebody that you're so close to because we're just, it's not something that we experience so young in life, so, so hard hitting, you know? Yeah, I mean, definitely. So I like my boyfriend that I lost at the time, he was like my first boyfriend, my first love. Um, he was like a wonderful person. And like, even now, like I'm like 34. And it still doesn't make sense to me. Like, I'm like, how can you take someone who is just such a beautiful person on this earth? Like, and I think that anyone who knows someone struggling with cancer can say the same thing. And it's interesting going through at such a young age because yes, there was no one else going through this. Like it did feel very isolating. Um, I didn't know a single person who had like lost someone that was so important to them um, at, at that age as well. Like, you know, like parents going through it. And even still, I don't really know many um, friends with parents that have gone through it like touch wood yeah, yet. Um, but at the time it was isolating. And I think also like being a student, I it was really hard for me to even process kind of what was happening um, and trying to just kind of live a normal life and like, go, go to classes and like pass your exams and stuff. And I, I think that is one of the major reasons why the grief did take such a toll on my body because grief, like you kind of, you have to process it. Like there are seven stages of grief. And I think that I was just so young and trying to kind of navigate this world that, you know, felt really isolating. I didn't really know how to go through it. I was trying to just like be a student. Um, and so I think it really did take a toll on my body. And I think that the, that's why the grief manifested itself in that way. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. your brain was like, we're just going to keep going. We're going to keep yeah. marching on. We're going to just keep going through the motions. And your body's like, nope. <laughs> we're going to make yeah. you stop and slow down and really 100%. try to get through this. And I feel like in our society, like we don't really process in our culture. Like I think North American culture, we don't really process grief 
properly. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just like this major thing happens and you still get up and you go to work and like you pick your kid up from school and, you know, you, you just have to kind of go through the motions, but then this like major thing is happening on the other side. It's like the first time you go to the grocery store, it's like, like you're just going to the grocery store again, but like, this is the first time you've gone to the grocery store and this person is no longer alive. Everything feels like you're reliving it for the first time in a way. It's a very funny thing, grief. And I don't think that we as a society really kind of give the space that maybe other cultures do in that grieving process. Yeah. And so that kind of triggered this change in your body that led to you kind of also following your intuition about, yes. you know, all these providers are telling me, yeah, you're just gonna have to go on these meds, whatever, but I yes. know there's gotta be a different way. So you started kind of taking those steps yourself towards the healing. And I love that you did that. I think it's really important for all of us to really tune in to what our bodies are telling us and, mm-hmm. you know, follow those steps and trial and error, right? So. Mm-hmm. Um, but the good news is that you eat wheat now, right? Because I see yeah. you have lots of yes. recipes yeah. in your book. It's I uh-huh. actually don't eat wheat because I have sensitivities to it, and I'm hoping yeah. someday I will be back on the other side. Yeah, of I think that's what it is too. And when wheat. I was going kind of through this elimination diet. It, for me, it was really helpful to kind of take everything away and then slowly reintroduce things to know kind of where the inflammation was happening. So even things like sugar, I mean, I don't, I, I tend to try and lean more towards gluten-free and sugar-free, but I can indulge every once in a while in that and mm-hmm. be okay. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that elimination was really helpful in doing that slow reintroduction. And I even actually went, when I started kind of thinking, you know, do I want to introduce gluten? Again, like I feel like my body's in an okay space. I took a gluten intolerance test to make sure that I wasn't celiac to like be 100% certain on that. Um, And then it was just kind of a slow reintroduction. But I think the way that it was described to me was like, if you have a glass and your glass is already filled to the brim and you just keep adding water, it's going to overflow. Like we need to kind of get this glass down a bit. Like we need to drink a little so that we can replenish and we can refill and, you know, we can start adding things back before we just kind of keep topping on before it spills over. So that's kind of how it was explained to me. Yeah. And, and I'm glad that you're explaining that because I feel like sometimes when we discover we have some of these food sensitivities, it can be devastating because in your brain, you're thinking, oh my gosh, it's going to be forever for the rest of my yeah. life. And literally bread is one of my favorite things <laughs> yeah, totally. in the world. Um, so, but you're right that once you get the inflammation down, sometimes you are able to add it back judiciously probably yes. not back to like three, four, five times a day again, you know, yeah. but, but able to tolerate it a little bit more. So, okay. So let's transition a little bit and talk about cooking because mm-hmm. wow, these recipes, <gasps> amazing. I just mouthwatering, just look at the pictures, but have you always been a great cook and how did you discover your love for cooking? So I feel like this is such a good question. So I, I would not say that I've always been a good cook. I've definitely always loved food. Like my first word was chocolate, which is kind of funny. Oh, wow, I love it. Yeah, I know. My mom was like, it was around Easter. Like I'm the third kid. So there was lots of chocolate in the house. And I was like running around going, chocolate, chocolate. <laughs> I'm like, mom, I must have been a slow talker. Like if that was my first word. She's like, yes, you were very slow. You basically just pointed and whined at everything for many months. But anyways, my first word was chocolate. So um. I've always had a love for food at a very, very young age. Um, My mom was the cook in our house growing up. We cooked a lot. Like we didn't really eat a lot of takeout. Um, She was a stay at home mom. So, you know, she really prioritized like dinners, like having dinners together, dinners at a table, like sitting together as a family. That was like a big priority in my house. Um, So I really kind of grew up with food as like a main focus and I always really loved it. Um, In terms of cooking, I feel like I really kind of started to find a love for cooking when I developed these um, food intolerances and when I developed my IBS because um, it was like a new form of cooking that was never really available. Like I, I kind of had to do things on my own because like things 
things weren't as readily available, um, you know, to just kind of buy in like a box or like order from like a restaurant or whatever. So I did a lot of cooking at home and I, I kind of explored and started to kind of, you know, introduce like new vegetables and new grains, as I said, to my diet, things like quinoa, things like amaranth, like things that I had never really experienced. Um, so it almost kind of became like a little bit of an experiment in the kitchen. And I think that's where my like cooking really kind of unfolded. Um, what I found was really interesting is when we were in like university or even like just after university, I would invite my friends over for dinner and I would cook for them, um, like, you know, some like healthy dish or whatever, and they would love it. And so I would start sharing my recipes and, um, they would ask me for recipes. Like I would make something and, you know, I'd get like three separate people texting me after the dinner being like, can you send me the recipe for this? So it became like a really fun thing for me. Um, and then I was like, oh, it would be like really nice to kind of have like a hub where, um, I just, you know, shared all my recipes um, and my friends could make them. And so I think that's where my my spark and my desire for blogging came is because I think I just like have a natural knack for understanding like food and flavor. Um, people tend to like it. And so I think that's where that underlying passion for starting a blog came from is because my friends and family just loved my cooking so much. And that aligns perfectly with the name of your blog and why you named it that way, right? Yeah, yeah. So I named my blog Two Spoons and the whole idea is that it's like recipes worth sharing. So, you know, when you like go to a restaurant and um, like say that like you don't order dessert, but your friend does, you're like, no, I'm okay. Like I don't need the dessert. And then they bring the dessert and the waiter or the waitress or server will always give two spoons because they know that that other person who didn't get the dessert is going to be pining for a bite. Like you're going to be looking at your friend's dessert and be like, I need a bite of that. So they always bring two spoons. And so that's where the idea came from with two spoons is my blog name. I love that. I just yeah. love the spirit of that and community <laughs> and generosity. I yeah. will say though, okay, I'm just going to be 100% transparent here. I don't like to share my food, okay? So you know, how about we just order two desserts? <laughs> Oh my God. You're so, you remind me of my husband. He hates sharing. And I am like such a person who's like, can I have some of that? And he's like, why didn't you just order? So now he or always orders extra. He's like, are you going to eat some of this? Because I will get a side of fries if you are going to have some. <laughs> I know you're going to eat mine. So I'm just going to yeah. order your own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I and love that. That's beautiful. In that one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you're originally from Canada, you grew up in Canada, mm -hmm. but you end up ended up in France because of yes. your partner's work. So yeah, French cuisine known for being very heavy in meat, cream and cheese. I remember before yeah. I was vegan, my uh, husband and I, we splurged on this fancy dinner in Boston at this, you know, French restaurant. And it was like, I feel like it was like pure cream and yeah. like meat. So doesn't surprise did, me at all. <laughs> yeah. How did you navigate eating a plant based diet in your new surroundings when you moved to France? Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of a funny story because I feel like this is where my veganism really took off. Like when we decided to go to France, I was like this, you know what? Like I've always wanted to be vegan. I always felt like I, it was more of an inconvenience at home because we were always like meeting with our friends and family. And I was like, oh, I don't want to be that person who's like annoying when I come to dinner and they're like, what do I make for you? So I was always kind of resistant. Also, like when we talk about veganism, it's not, it wasn't to the same degree then as it is now. Um, so I felt like it was like quite an inconvenience. And then when we got this opportunity to move abroad to France, I was like, this is going to be it. Like, this is going to, now I can go vegan. Like I do all the cooking. Um, I'm not going to be bothering anyone, but it's just so funny that like I decided to go vegan when I moved to France because France is known for like cheese and charcuterie. <laughs> So I arrived as this like new vegan, like I have come out of like my shell <laughs> as a vegan and I arrive in France and everyone is like, what? Like you're a what? <laughs> so I tell this story in my cookbook about um, this restaurant my husband and I went to and we had actually called in advance to say like, oh, you know, like we're vegan. Um, we'd really like to come to your restaurant. Like could the chef, you know, make anything like it, you know, whatever the chef wants to make um you know we'll just eat it and so we um sit down to this dinner and our main comes and i kid you not it was 
half a cooked carrot, like chopped in half, like Mitch had one half, it wasn't even a full carrot, Mitch had one half and I had the other. <laughs> and it had these like little, like, you know how the French love to do like those little, um, like little spots of like colored yeah, the garnishes dressing or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> just like a little bit of garnish on top. And it was just like a half cooked carrot. And we were like, oh my God, like if this is not the biggest F you, I don't know what <laughs> that chef in the back was laughing so freaking oh hard. God. He was like, he was like these rabbits, these rabbits, yeah. I give them carrots. Yeah, exactly. That's definitely what he was thinking. He's like, don't come back to my restaurant. Like, <laughs> I never come back, you stupid vegan. <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah, that's only happened to me one time. I've been vegan. It'll be 12 years this mm -hmm. summer. And it was a restaurant, <laughs> ironically named in French, uh, oh, in New Orleans funny. called Le Chocon. So I guess yeah. it's that's a little pig or the pig. And yeah. I've never had trouble before, uh, but that chef definitely had an attitude. And that he was like, no, there's nothing there. Everything is already has meat products and I can't separate anything. So yeah. while my friends were having this like huge barbecue dinner, they yeah. brought me like half a cup. It was like a tiny little, like one of those little dessert size yeah. things of pickled cucumbers. That was oh. my meal. <gasps> I was so upset. I was so hungry too. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That sounds so brutal. That's hilarious. Like these, but these stories are so funny later on, but in the moment you're just like, oh my God, like, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's like mortifying. What about as you were making friends and acquaintances there, mm -hmm. what would people say? So it's actually interesting because I give that story about, you know, this hilarious story about me going to a restaurant, but in general, I I actually feel like I would not be the cook that I am today without my experience in France. Because when you think about like the culture of food, I don't think that there's a better country you can be in. Like it is so underlying, rooted in tradition, this idea of eating well at every single meal. Um, and I feel like we share this same value, like this inner, this deep value was a shared value, even though maybe it was like the types of foods were a little bit different, like this underlying value was the same. And so I would like every day there was a market in the city that I could go to a farmer's market. Um, so you could pick up fresh vegetables right from the farmer um, every single day. It was, like, and I would know, I'd be like, hey, Mondays it's in Wazem and then Wednesdays it's in Sebastopol. And like, I would know like all the places to go um, to get this fresh, ve fresh veg. And I would make friends with the vendors um, and they would teach me ways to cook vegetables that I never knew. Like they knew so much about cooking. So I would buy something and they would be like, roast it in the oven, add salt, like add sage, add like, so they'd be teaching me how to cook this, um, which was so cool. Um, and another thing that was really cool is, so I was in France, we moved around 20, I think it was 2016. So this is really when the plant-based scene was really kind of starting to unravel, like especially in North America. Um, and so in the years that I was there, I, start, I started to kind of see it like pick up in France. So like these little um, shops or these little restaurants that were completely vegan would start to pop up and I would go in and I would introduce myself and say like, I'm a vegan blogger. Um, France is also where I should mention where I decided to start my blog, Two Spoons. This is when I started to share my recipes is when I moved to France. Um, so I would say, you know, I'm this new vegan blogger. I'm Canadian, but I'm living here and I, I see you have this like wonderful restaurant and we we would just chat about, you know, like where they bought their coconut yogurt and like where they got this and, you know, and we would text each other and DM each other. Um, and so it really kind of built this really beautiful little community within Leal of people who had this like shared interest and this shared value for this type of cooking. So, um, yeah, I really kind of say that I don't think I would be the cook that I am today without that experience living in France. That's cool. What a little community and, you yeah, know, blossomed all kind of unexpectedly and organically. Yeah. yeah, definitely. How else do you think living in France changed your perspective just in general on food and eating? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I just, I honestly feel like it's so different there. Even think the way the pace of life just feels very different. So 
in Canada, like we'll go in Toronto, we'll go into a coffee shop, like even say like a Starbucks and you get your coffee to go. Like you don't sit down and have your drink. And in France, like no one is ever walking around with a coffee cup. Like <laughs> it is like, I don't, it just doesn't exist. Like no one does that. If you even go into like, um, we'll take Paul, for example, Paul is kind of similar to like a Starbucks or like Tim Hortons if you're from Canada. Um, it, you, it's still kind of fast food, but you take your coffee and you go up to like the little standing counter and you drink your coffee and you have your croissant or you have your baguette or whatever it is that you're eating and you eat it there and you make a moment out of it. Um, and I think that was something of the culture that I had not seen in Canada. Like, I feel like we almost think of like drinking and eating as like an afterthought. It's like, I've got all this stuff to do on my busy schedule and I'm just going to, you know, eat the salad while I'm checking my emails or I'm going to drink this coffee on the way to work. But there they really make a moment of everything. And I really love that. Like, even when you would go to the markets on weekends, there all the restaurants would be, you know, surrounding the square and people would be taking their lunch. And and then they would go and do their shopping. And it was just such a part of their culture that I loved so much. Um, and I even said to my husband when we moved back, it was something that I didn't want to lose. So now every morning, like, we have our tea and coffee together. Like, that's something that we, like, maybe we don't, you know, go out as much like not living in like a big city anymore but like that's something that we really wanted to bring back like we didn't just want to kind of fall back into these norms and you know finding like local farmers markets around here that we can you know join a farm share um and get this fresh vegetable and communicate with the farmers and um and just kind of see food in that way is um a value that i really wanted to bring back yeah, uh, that is such a cultural difference. I agree. Yeah. And in the United States, we're now eating an average of seven times per day. And I think yeah. it's because it's people just eat on the go. So there's no yeah. separation between an eating opportunity where you sit down, you enjoy your meal, you're present with your meal, you're present yeah. with your family and the rest of life. And so it all kind of blends together. And so eating time is all the time, which yeah. is not good for us. It's not good for our digestion, especially for somebody who had IBS. I'm sure you could yes. understand that. Like that's not good for your digestion to have food in there constantly trying to be digested. So yeah. I love that they have this clear boundary. They're like, no, I don't eat on the run. I don't eat on the <laughs> yeah. car. You know, yeah. I don't eat in front of the computer. I'm no. going to sit down, eat. I'm going to give this to myself as a moment of self-care and love that and is... attention to my body. Yes, that is exactly it. Like, I think that we need to start thinking of meals as self-love and self-care. Like, I feel like there's this huge, you know, awakening of taking care of ourselves and this self-love. Like, I hear it all the time in, like, pop culture and media now about taking care of ourselves. But where are, like, what, we never talk about it about food like sitting down and eating a meal and like putting away our electronics and just like being with ourselves and like enjoying something like i if your taste isn't like taste is one of the five senses right it's so why are we not acknowledging it as a moment of self-care and enjoyment yeah, I'm super selfish about it. I, I love to sit down to my meal and just really yeah. enjoy it and savor it. I don't want to be like, oh, did I just eat? What was even, what how, what did it even taste yeah. like? I don't know. I was totally distracted, you know? Like, yeah. to me, it's delicious enough that I want to enjoy every bite. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And I know people who are like that, where it's an afterthought. Sometimes they forget to eat. Like, and I'm just like, I could never. Like, I feel like my, once I'm done a meal, I'm thinking about when I'm going to be hungry for my next one. <laughs> I know my office manager jokes around that sometimes even during a meal, she's already thinking about her next meal. <laughs> yeah, We're all my foodies favorite, around here. Yeah. My favorite thing is like going to bed because I know I'm closer to breakfast. It's like, oh, am I going to bed now? <laughs> we are soul sisters. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your book because it's such a beautiful book. What? Oh, I know it's you. hard. I ask this to like cookbook authors all the time and they get mad at me, but do you have a favorite recipe in this book? If so, which yeah. one would it be? There's so many. I literally can't even pick one because I feel like when I made this book, I put so much care into each and every recipe that I think each and every one is amazing. Like, and I Aww. cook from my book all the time. Like, 
like three to four times a week, I'm pulling out this book and I'm cooking dinner, I'm cooking lunch, I'm making breakfast from it. Like it is this, I'm coming up to my one year anniversary at the end of this month. And this book is still as valuable to me now as like when it first like came on stands. Um, I would say lately, uh, I've been really enjoying my carrot soup, which we talked about prior. I've got this coconut carrot soup. That's so good. I just feel like it's a really nice introduction into spring. Um, there's a really beautiful vegan quiche in there. Um, mm. it's a spinach and mushroom quiche, which is so good. I would say people are completely obsessed with the mushroom bourguignon. If you like love this, like kind of like deep flavorful dish. So it takes the beef bourguignon and we kind of readapt it into this mushroom bourguignon and serve with buttery mashed potatoes. It is such a cozy dish like it would be perfect for date night with like a glass of red wine um i highly recommend that one i also love my salad niçoise um it's really bright and refreshing it's got this really like delicious citrusy lemon vinaigrette um so that feels really springy for right now um in the time frame that we're in and then i would say if you're if there's one dish that you have to try that you don't want to miss um it's my uh my baked brie so if you thought if you were vegan and you missed your brie this is the recipe for you. It's so, you won't even believe how easy it is to do. I think it's like five ingredients. You mix it together in a blender, put it in a brie baking dish and bake it. And you will not believe the taste and consistency that this has to brie. Like it is shocking. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, yeah. I have a confession because I was never a cheese person ever. Yeah. But I took four years of French in high school and a year in college and in the French club, we always had brie when we had our meetings. Yeah. And brie <laughs> yeah. was the only cheese I really I like loved. And I think the reason is, see, what page is that? I'm going to look that it up right now. That is page 160. Because brie is just, I love it because it's so buttery and mild. It I doesn't know. have that super strong flavor. Yeah. Oh yeah, my gosh. it's really oh, creamy. That looks amazing. Yeah, and the texture is so similar to brie. Like you won't, you just won't believe it. It's just. It's just so good. <laughs> okay, so that's going to be on my Mother's Day list because I, I, yes. I'm looking and I have all these ingredients at home already so I can make yeah. that. And the one I'm eyeing for Mother's Day this weekend is this golden roasted yes. carrot hummus because I yes, have so like good. two bags of carrots in my fridge right now and we love hummus yeah. and it looks amazing. So I think I'm going to yeah. make those too. I really enjoyed playing with these hummuses. So I've also got like a pink beetroot hummus um, and I feel like that – it felt very, very French to me. Like when I was going to the like vegan cafes and restaurants and stuff, they would just have these like beautiful, vibrant, like different Thomases. And so I was like, this has to be part of my book because I feel like this cookbook is a really good, um, it's a good blend of like modern day French and traditional um, and kind of how the plant-based world is kind of moving in that direction in France. So I really kind of think that the recipes really ring true to this like old tradition, but then bringing in that like new vegan flair to French food and yeah, colorful hummus was definitely one of the things that they were into. Yes. And then I, I also want to point out for people that love macaroons and yes. haven't been able to have them because those are yes. really hard to find vegan since they use yeah. egg. So for those that it looks like it's pretty simple to make too, huh? Those yeah, look amazing. So they are so good. You're like, oh my God. And the inside, um, the filling is actually a recipe for my vegan Nutella. So you, it's like a two in one recipe. Um, and they're just beautiful. They are made with aquafaba. So if anyone who doesn't know aquafaba is chickpea brine. So when you're like rinsing out the water from your can of chickpeas, instead of throwing it down the drain, throw it into a jar and you can use it to make things like meringue, um, macaron, like so many delicious dishes. I just made um, matcha co amaretti cookies with aquafaba. So like there's so many different ways that we can use it. And it basically what it is, it's, it gives this like light, fluffy, almost it's like a cross between like an egg white and a whipped cream. Um, so it's really, really great for making these more traditional European inspired um, baked goods. Yeah, it does. It turns out really light, though. I remember making yeah, meringue for the first time light. with aquafaba. It was in a class I was taking, and I was just floored. I was like, how uh -huh. did that just happen? That's amazing. I know, it's crazy. It's so crazy. And for anyone who, like, doesn't have the book, think 
any of the more, because the recipes, I, it was really important for me to make the recipes very simple and easy to follow along. Like I am that kind of cook that I don't want it to be a challenge, but for any of those more involved French recipes, like a macaron or like a croissant, there are like step-by-steps that you can follow along so that you, when you're following the instructions and you think like, oh, what does she mean by that? Like there are like visuals too, so that, you know, you, you're not getting lost in those. But I will say that, um, in my experience in France, it was hard, like, because the vegan scene wasn't as big as like, say somewhere like Vancouver, um, or somewhere Mm -hmm. like California, like it was hard to find ingredients that most people would recommend, like really like, like even coconut aminos, like I could never find that in France. And so when I was making this cookbook, I was like, all of these ingredients need to be accessible. Like they need to be available, like whether you live in a big city or a small town. So when you're going through the ingredients, and I think you even mentioned for the recipe for the hummus, you're like, oh, I have it everything here. And that was a big must for me because I found it really frustrating when I would be in France and I would be seeing people cooking these vegan recipes. And I was like, I can't buy half these ingredients. Like, yeah, it doesn't exist here. For sure. It's frustrating. And then people just give up and there's like, yeah, exactly. Obviously I can't make any of these things. It's inaccessible for me. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to explore some of these recipes. And I hope the listeners are also having a mouth watering reaction right now. So <laughs> they so. pick up your book and try some of these. Um, okay, let's shift gears and talk about parenting. So you're a mom now. So let's talk yeah. about your perspective on parenting on a plant based diet. Oh, that's a very good question. So my son is 20 months old now, and he is on a vegan diet. We eat vegan, like I, I cook vegan, so he eats vegan. Um, it was interesting because I feel like they're, I feel like raising a child on a vegan diet is a challenge in itself. And I feel like everyone has different opinions and maybe the way I'm doing it isn't like the right way, but like, I'm just kind of going with the flow and like not making such a big deal about things. So one of the things that they said when Ollie, I think when they get to six months, it's such a blur now. It's crazy. Like being a mom, I'm like, was it this? Was the one was this? But they basically say when they get to six months, like to start introducing like um, allergen foods. So because you don't want your kids to develop an allergy, which means that you have to introduce them to to dairy products and things like that. And so I kind of had this like, oh, like, do I do this? Do I not? Because like, we don't eat, like, I don't even have these ingredients at home. Like I have to go buy them. And I decided that I was going to do it because I didn't want Ollie to be out at a party and say he has something with dairy in it and he gets an allergy because I never introduced it. So I did the introduction, but I remember getting a bit of backlash on my Instagram And just feeling like, I don't know what to do. Like, I just don't know what's the right thing to do as a mom. And I feel like when it comes to parenting, like, it's such a new place that I don't even know if I'm doing it right. But I'm just kind of doing what I think is right. And for me, that was important to me. So my whole kind of way that I treat Ollie is like, when we're in the house, we're vegan. When we go out to restaurants, I order him vegan. But when it's uh, like not even that this has happened yet, but like when he goes to a birthday party and maybe there's something that's not vegan, like ice cream, then I'm not going to make a big deal of it if that's something that he wants to to have with his friends because at home we'll have the vegan ice cream. <laughs> and that's kind of my approach. That's kind of how I've kind of come to it. And right now he's still so young. He's 20 months that I still feel like I have a lot of control over it. But it's definitely a, it's a difficult way to navigate and it's funny too because like now you have a new human that you are in control of and it's like it's when it's you you have all the say but when there's a new human it's like they are starting to they're going to start navigating through life and so um my hope is that you no matter what happens with ollie i hope that you know he'll come back to a vegan diet on his own if he ever does veer off like say he's in his teens and he's like oh you know my friends are eating this and blah blah like my hope is that like I have introduced him to a world that like he will make the right decisions and if he comes off course like he'll come back yeah Um, Yeah. I'm just going to reassure you that you are doing the right thing and the reason (laughs) you're doing the right thing is because it's a choice that there is no right or wrong right so I'm going to send you a copy of my book so you will see that these words have already been written for you oh amazing you know I, I think when it comes to those kinds of things the most important thing is you figure out what works best for your family, what works uh-huh. aligns best with your values, what 
feels you know, the simplest, but also know that things can change because kids are constantly changing. The world around us is constantly changing. You're going to go through lots of different phases. Just like you said, right now, he's mostly at home. There's not very much exposure. Once they get to school, bam, it's (laughs) like literally a birthday party every single day. If it's not birthday, it's some sort of holiday, like all the time. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. I think having that ease and having that openness for them Mm -hmm. to start navigating and exploring their choices Mm -hmm. conveys to them that you trust them as well and it allows them to explore because whenever we're telling them no you can't have that why because i said you can't have that you know yeah that's bad for you or it's going to make you sick or whatever those negative messages start to impact how they relate to food in their bodies and you're right i tell families you know we can't control what our kids are going to do in the future, right? Like we are just providing them this safe, loving environment, trying to pass down to them our values. We don't know what they're going to do in the future. However, I think that setting that strong foundation and talking to them about all the reasons, you know, it's for, it promotes our health. It promotes the health of the planet. It's also kinder to animals. These are all the reasons we choose to do this. Take it leave what you're not going to use, go on with your life. But I feel like setting that foundation, what I see when we do it without pressure is they do come back to it, you know, because you set that foundation and it just makes sense because we're not pressuring it. We're not telling them you must live like this no matter what, Mm. you know, because every person is their own individual, including our children. I I don't think you could have said that more perfectly. (laughs) Well, well, you know, I talk about it all the time, so it's yeah. practiced a little yeah. bit. And, and my children like... are 13 and 18, so uh, <laughs> I'm just yeah, a little, so, yeah. st- a few steps ahead of you. So I've yeah, had to exactly. go through all of those times. It's yeah, normal you know to feel, exactly what it's like. yeah, yeah, it's normal to feel like you're not, you don't know what you're doing or you're doing yeah. it wrong or everybody's Motherhood telling you you're doing it wrong. Motherhood is basically that. Like, I feel like you're always like two steps behind, like, <laughs> Like, it's always like you think you have something figured out and then they start doing something new and you're like, whoa, I didn't anticipate this. Like, what What do I do now? <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. got to be hard when you're in the public eye because you're a popular blogger, you're an influencer, and you're always going to find people that do not agree with what you're doing regardless of what you're doing. So that's yeah. got to be tough to adapt to as well. I feel like I'm so glad that you brought that up because I feel like I'm 34 now and I started blogging when I went to France. So let's say I was 26 when I got into this and, you know, Instagram had just come out with stories and all this stuff. And I feel like in my late 20s, early 30s, I spent a lot of time worrying about how things would be perceived. And I feel like as I get older, I'm just like, no, like the, I'm just gonna live my life for me and the way I feel is genuine and I feel like I'm making a difference. And if someone else has a different opinion, then that's great. They can live their life like that. But I'm not gonna worry anymore about like if whether or not doing an elimination diet with my son is like of like vegan values because I know that I feel better knowing that I've introduced an allergen to him and I don't have to worry about that later on. Yeah. I love <laughs> yeah. it. You're you're getting wise already in your young years. I consider you a baby, so <laughs> but the wisdom is already coming through. Oh. Well, speaking of your blog, how has being a mom influenced your blog and your career? Because obviously it's something that you've worked so hard on and and done, you know, devoted so much time to. How has being a mom shifted that? Oh, my God. Okay, so I always say that being the mom was like the best and worst thing for my business. (laughs) Because I was a very much a workaholic before Ollie came into my life and, and I struggled really hard to, um, have him. Like we really struggled with infertility for many years. And so, um, when he came into my life, there was almost like this guilt about, you know, wanting to continue my career when I have this other human being that I love so much and that I've wanted for so long. And I feel like it was a really hard time in my life to find a balance between being a mom and running my business. And um, I, like I said, I really struggle with it. I was a workaholic and I 
I don't think, I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist, but I like things a certain way. And I tend to think that if I just do it myself, then it'll be that way. (laughs) So I was taking on a lot. And I think when I had Ollie, it really was the wake up call that I needed to kind of let go a little. And I needed to start thinking of my business as something that could happen long term. And the only way that was going to happen is if I started putting my trust in other people and bringing on a team. And so that would not have happened without having my son. And now I have a lot of help. I have people that help, like I I hired someone on to help with my newsletter and my social media and kind of tracking through, you know, how, how the next month is going to look on social media and helping with that planning and stuff like that. I have someone that helps me with my video editing so that we can get YouTube content onto my website in a timely manner. And then we can use that content for things like TikTok and YouTube shorts and Instagram. Um, so that was stuff that I was all doing on my own before. Um, and now that I'm a mom, I'm like, no, like this, it's impossible to do it all. Um, you need help and you need support. And so, and fortunately I was in a place in my business that I was able to finance that. Um, so I think it's, It's definitely a challenge and I can completely relate to anyone who is like either starting a business or like want to start a business and they have little ones at home. Like I don't think there's any harder thing in the world (laughs) than trying to run your own business or start a business when you have kids. And like my hand goes up to moms who do it because it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, So if there's anyone who's kind of looking to do that, I think that, you know, you just have to be smart with your time and know what you can um, allocate to other people and also know, you know, how when you're thinking of your business really, and this is maybe not always a popular thing to think about, but like think about how you're going to make money off of it and then how you can you know, repurpose that to bring people on. Because I think when we think of, you know, a successful business today, we look at the number of followers that people have on Instagram. And I am telling you firsthand that the number of followers you have on Instagram does not relate to money in your bank. (laughs) So it's really kind of a shift of really understanding, you know, where, where am I going to make money? How am I going to make this sustainable? And how am I going to make this long term? Uh, I love all of that. And it just makes me think of, I feel like as women, especially, we have this need to give and just to give so much and to exhaust ourselves in the giving, but we really struggle with receiving. So even if it's not hiring somebody, like paying somebody to help you, women struggle just asking for help from their loved ones and their neighbors and their friends. They feel like they have to do it all themselves. (laughs) Otherwise they're a failure. They're not a good mom. So practicing that art of receiving, practicing the art of delegation. And I will just say, I don't want to be sexist or stereotype, but I'm probably gonna do it right now. I think men especially, they need specific directions. (laughs) Like you can't just tell your husband and be like, I need help. Like they're literally (laughs) like, I don't know what to do. Like you have to tell them specifically, I need you to do this thing at this time, please. (laughs) You know, And we have a hard time with that. So I think that that's also something to practice when we become new moms and have young kids is being okay, receiving, being okay, asking Mm -hmm. and getting help. This is such, that is such a good Uh, recommendation, Dr. Yami. And it makes me remember. So when my cookbook was coming out, I was trying to do it all. Like I was literally trying to do the whole thing. I had Ollie, he was only like, he was maybe five or six months at the time. And my my cookbook was launching. It was crazy. And I remember talking to a friend and I was like, I don't know what, how I'm, I don't, I'm not surviving. Like I'm really struggling. And she was like, you need to get yourself a mother's little helper. And I was like, what is that? And she's like, when I had my baby, there was like a young girl, she was like 10 or 11. And every day after school, she would come, she just was a neighbor. She would come and she would help take my kid. And, you know, I would cook dinner and she would just watch my kid and play with my kid. And she was like, ask your neighbor, ask your neighborhood kids if they'll come and watch Ollie. And I was like, this is the best idea ever. And no one had ever like mentioned that to me before. I think that it is so silent, you know, all this like background support that people get. And I don't think people are often getting. So like to have someone kind of like 
tell me that this is okay and like you know you can get support and I actually ended up having my neighbor's kid come over and help me with Ollie like during those time like during those months and those summer months because it was so busy and she would just come after school and watch Ollie and it was so helpful yeah and I bet it was so such a relief too to have even just an hour or two where you could focus yeah, it's really 100%. hard to focus when you have a baby <laughs> Yeah. And my baby's not a good sleeper. Like I remember thinking like, oh, you know, like I remember taking on client projects when, and they were like, aren't you about to like, are you about to have a baby? And I was like, oh yeah, but I heard they sleep a lot as newborns. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. And like my kid was not a good sleeper. And so I was like, how am I ever going to get these client projects done? <laughs> yeah. Literally a statement like that, you know, in medicine, we're kind of superstitious about some stuff, but a statement yeah. like that is attracting a baby that doesn't sleep. Oh, I did something I similar. I manifested that. <laughs> <laughs> my, um, I had my first child in medical school and I had already mm -hmm. done call and been up all night. And I'm just like, I can stay up. Yeah. How hard can it be? Yeah. The thing, the difference between being a doctor and being on call is you go off call. Yeah. When you have a baby, there's no off call. It's like no. 24 7, no 365 call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's the part I didn't think about. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the that's the, such a like perfect way to describe it as mom. There is no tapping out. Like you are always mom one hundred percent of the time. Like as if it's three in the afternoon or three in the morning. Like yes. <laughs> it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. They're worth it though. They are one hundred percent. I could say yeah. especially now that I have an eighteen year old, it goes way too fast. I can't believe it. Like Ollie's turning two at the end of August and I'm like, I feel like I blinked and it happened. I'm like, no, you're still my baby. Like, oh, well, he is. Yeah. He always will be. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> well, Hannah, what do you wish more people knew? Uh, I... Okay, well, from a food perspective, I would say um, I wish people knew that going on a vegan diet doesn't need to be intimidating. I think that people think like, I don't know how to cook this way. Like this seems too difficult. Like this is an uprooting of my life. Like I just, I just, it's too much effort. And I think that if people just gave it a try, they would realize that it actually isn't an effort. It's just a change and a reframe in what you're doing currently. Like everyone needs to eat dinner and it's just a reframe of like, instead of like pulling out like the chicken, you pull out the tofu. And like, instead of like making beef, like you grab like lentils or like mushroom and make a mushroom bourguignon. So I think that like, just kind of reframing that, like maybe it'll be like a little bit of a learning process in the beginning, but once you get it, like it is seamless. And I think also like people think that they have to make a complete shift and change in their diet when they go vegan. And it doesn't need to be that way. Like my recommendation for anyone who's kind of considering going on a plant-based diet is to take their favorite recipe, go into Google, and type it out into Google and write vegan next to it. <laughs> and then they'll see that like they they can eat everything that they love and enjoy on a vegan diet. Like it doesn't need to be a complete switch. Um, and I think I always try and kind of prove that with my recipes. So that would be my recommendation as a foodie. And then um, as a mom, I would say, Dr. Yami, like I think you put it so perfectly, is that like it is okay to to ask for help um and i think like again in our society like we want to be like the best at everything like we want to be doing it all and like we want to feel like we can have it all like we can and i think that it's been kind of fed to us in our system that like you can be a boss mom like you can be all these things and like yes you can be these things but not without uh, the other and so you have to ask for help you have to ask for support and sometimes I feel like I'm like being an amazing mom and I'm sucking at my job and sometimes I feel like I'm killing it at my job and I'm sucking as a mom so like you can have it all but you can't always have it all at once <laughs> yes so that's kind of my recommendation for moms <laughs> uh, I love it Hannah okay <laughs> you do have a, a little one I ask this of all of my guests is if you have a morning routine if so mm -hmm. share it with us Okay, so um, I, <laughs> you're gonna laugh at this. So I am not a morning person <laughs> at all. So my husband does always does the honors when Ollie wakes up at six, he takes Ollie and he lets me sleep in. <laughs> Love and then it. Around, I know it's so nice. And then around seven, seven thirty, he wakes me up with a tea. <laughs> So I'm a tea drinker, so he'll get my tea ready and then he'll come wake me up and then I'll come downstairs and we'll have tea and coffee together and we'll sit with Ollie while he plays. Um, and then um, 
like either I'll take him to daycare or he'll take him to daycare, but it's like that moment that we get together. Um, so our morning routine is small because I spend most of it sleeping. <laughs> That's valuable though. <laughs> Honestly, and like as a mom too, like, and my son still doesn't sleep through the night. He still wakes up two to three times. It's like, I would not be able to function without Mitch taking yeah. him like in those yeah. mornings. It's But I know it's funny too, because I'm not a night person either. Like I like don't even stay up late. So I always tell people. You're just I'm a like, sleep person yeah. is what you are. <laughs> Like 8.30 to like 7.30 p.m. person. Like talk to me during those hours, but don't bother me late at night or early in the morning. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. My kids know that after 8.30 p.m. I turn into a pumpkin. Yeah. So don't ask me anything. Like don't ask me yeah. to help you with anything. Like I'm like, no, I'm sorry. I have to go yeah, to like sleep. My brain so. doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Hannah, we've had so much fun together today. I am so glad that you came on the show. If you could just tell us where listeners can connect with you and what products and services you offer. Yeah, so you can connect with me on my blog, which is twospoons.ca. You can find me on Instagram at twospoons.ca. You can find me on YouTube. I've got a YouTube cooking channel. Um, it's my cooking show called Vegan Afternoon with Two Spoons. And you can find my book at anywhere books are sold. It's the Two Spoons Cookbook. Um, you can also order it on Amazon. It's at Barnes and Nobles, uh, Chapters Indigo. Um, so yeah, that's where you'll find me. I love it. Okay, last question. Leave us with your top three cooking tips for newbies that are just starting their vegan cooking journey. Yeah, so I would say, um, like I said prior, Go into Google and type your favorite recipe and put vegan in front of it, and you'll see that you can enjoy all the things you love on a vegan diet. I would say um, kind of take a look at, you know, where you're getting your protein. I think that's a common question that people get asked, like, oh, you're vegan? Well, where do you get your protein? And there's lots of sources of protein on a vegan diet. So do a little bit of research and see kind of where you can swap your chicken for protein. Great opportunities are um, lentils, uh, chickpeas, um, quinoa, like these, you know, grains that are full of protein, um, beans, nuts, seeds, um, tofu, tempeh. So there's lots of opportunities there. Um, so have fun experimenting with that. And then also, um, know kind of where you can add in flavor. Like you, pe people often say to me, oh, I love, um, I would love to be a vegan, but I can't give up my cheese. So knowing where you can get in that cheesy flavor. Vegans love getting a cheesy flavor, creamy textures and flavors through things like cashews, nutritional yeast. Um, so take a look at those ingredients and start experimenting them with the kit with them in the kitchen. And I think that you'll be surprised that you can enjoy all the things that you love on a vegan diet with these simple swaps. Yeah. We're not martyrs. We're not over here suffering. So if anybody <laughs> no. um, sees me, I, I am thoroughly enjoying my diet. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So I don't feel deprived at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Hannah, this has been very fun, very plantastic. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for your honesty, your transparency, your humor. What a fabulous episode. I'm so grateful for you. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Thank you, Dr. Yami. This was so fun. Thanks for having me. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.